Well, I'm talk to us for a while today on the topic, where then is the power? Where then is the power? 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 24. The King James text today reads, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, once again we come before the throne of grace. The man of God today is weak, frail, faulty. How I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If I am to convey to the people of God the message which you have placed in my spirit for this moment and this hour. Touch not only the speaker, but touch every hearer. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost open our hearts, make our hearts, our minds, our spirits ready to not only hear, but to receive the engrafted Word of God with gladness. Move by your Spirit. Allow our faith today, Lord, to be challenged. Allow it to be multiplied by reason of the preaching of your word. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We ask it all today and none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. How often do we find in the modern world that we are in some place, we're at some location, and suddenly we're in need of a power outlet. We need to find somewhere where we can plug in our phone or plug in our tablet. We're at the airport or we're at the bus station and suddenly we realize, my, I've been using my phone and I need power. Where is the power? Amen. I travel a good bit by airplane, and when I'm traveling, I'm always looking to see if they have any of those outlets, you know, where I can sit and plug in my phone or plug in my uh, laptop to get it all charged up for my flight. And even now, some of the airplanes will have USB ports so you can plug in some of your devices to charge. But we live in a time where we have so many different devices that require energy and require power and we are constantly on the lookout for a power outlet or for a power source. 
I'm here to tell you today, many come into the church and they're looking for a power outlet. They're looking for a place where they can plug into the power of God. They've been beat down. They've been tore up. Their faith has been assaulted all week long. And they need to charge their battery. Hallelujah. They need to be able to plug in. In Acts 1 and 8. In Acts 1 and 8, the Lord said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Many today will come in to churches and they will find a political institution wrapped in religious robes. The message they will hear is more of men than it is of God. It speaks of the need for believers to do for God. And it does not speak to that, listen to me children, which the Lord is able to do for the believer. We need to change the law in this country. We need to do away with Roe versus Wade. We need to bring America, to America back to God. Honey, you're preaching the wrong message. You don't need to do anything. You need My Lord have mercy. And I've got news for you prophetically from the Holy Ghost. If God doesn't do it, oh my Lord, it's because it don't need being done. All right. God didn't do away with Roe v. Wade. No. All of that was craftily done through conniving, through trickery. Listen. Uh, Republicans steal in a way a constitutionally granted right to Obama to appoint a Supreme Court justice. That was sheer trickery and connivory. It was evil, it was ungodly, and it was wrong. But there are Christians who laud this being done because it accomplished the ends that they were seeking to achieve. And that is to do away with Roe v. Wade. But my friend, I've got news for you today. If God wanted that done away with, God can do away with it without your help. That's right. The fact that it stood is because God wanted it to stand. God, listen to me, God does not impose righteousness by reason of legislation upon anyone. That's right. Even the law of Moses, it was up to each individual to embrace and follow and obey the law. And not every person, not every man, every woman in Israel lived up to the full mandate of the law. No. Some of them embraced certain parts. They may have had a, a kosher kitchen and they may have eaten kosher meals. And yet at the same time, they may have done work on the Sabbath when they ought not to have done work. Oh, nothing has changed in the world today. People pick and choose what they want to do That's and what right. they don't want to do. That's right. God did not create the law in order to force people into doing right. And the interesting thing is, no matter how many of the laws the people of Israel failed to live up to, 
You don't see God leveling judgment on Israel, listen to me now, until they fell after idolatry. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, everybody wants to talk about holiness. Everybody wants to talk about what is holiness. Holiness, my friend, is a wholehearted commitment to the God of Israel. You could break all the laws you wanted to, but as long as you remain true to Jehovah, God did not bring judgment down upon you. No, he brought judgment down. Look at your Bible, read it. Every single time, every single time, God allowed judgment to come down on Israel. Every time he allowed them to be conquered by the enemy, every time he allowed them to be carried away into slavery or to be carried away into bondage in Babylon, every single time it was in response to their infidelity to him. I'll tell you, I know a lot of LGBT people today who are backslidden out of church. They love the Lord. They love the Lord. Their heart is with this gospel. I know it. I've talked to them. I've, I've spoken to so many. I've been doing this 31 years, honey. I've, I've dealt with tens of thousands of LGBT people over the years. It is amazing to me how many of them would not surrender their faith if the devil himself stood before them with a knife to their throat and they would not yield their faith. They don't want anything to do with the church. They don't want anything to do with organized religion. They don't want anything to do with the building. They don't want to go and worship with other believers. My pastor, I've been hurt too much. I've been offended too much. I've been driven away. I've been pushed away. Yeah. I've had people do me dirty. I've had, listen, honey, when, when I was forced out, as it were, out of the closet, I've told the story before. I had a Pentecostal preacher effing me up one side down the other, used an F word on me. Pentecostal preacher, man. You're an effing pig. You're an effing dog. You're an effing child molester. You're an effing... Oh, man, he leveled everything. He can level against me. And I, at that point, I had never been with nobody. Uh, my God. Never done anything. Had, had never pursued the gay life in my life. But it got out that apparently I might be that way. Right. And oh, honey, all hell broke loose. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people are faithful to God. They're faithful. When I came out of church back in 89, when I was forced out, and I came out and I decided I was going to live honestly and I was going to be true to who I was, um, my faith didn't change. I still knew who Jesus was. Anybody ask me, you know, I don't know. Ooh, I tell you, he is God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the great I am. Hallelujah. I have told you in a flat second who Jesus was. If anybody asked me, do you happen to know how to get to heaven? I have said, yes, sir. You got to go through Jesus by way of the cross. Hallelujah. That is not a way. That is the way. The only reason Jesus is the only way to God is because Jesus is the physical incarnation of God. He is the revelation of God. Read the book of Revelation. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He said to Philip, Philip, how can you ask me, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How are you? He said, and from this day forward, you have seen him and you know him. Glory to God. 
The Old Testament prophet declared, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And for those who seem to want to twist their theology around to make Jesus a, a God creation of God Almighty. Well, the Lord always knows when people are going to mess with His Word. So He added the everlasting Father. And this prophecy spoke of the Son. This prophecy spoke of the Messiah. This prophecy spoke of the promised one. And yet, it did not declare that he would be the everlasting son. It declared that he was the everlasting father. Hallelujah to God. Oh, I want to tell you today, people come into the house of God. And they're like that person at the airport looking for a place to plug in and they ask where then is the power where's the power at is it in your worship no because you don't never sing of the cross you don't ever sing about the blood and according to our primary text today the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of God where is the power I'll tell you where it is it's in the preaching of the cross hallelujah it's not in preaching Donald Trump it's not in preaching Vega. it's not in preaching Christian nationalism it's in Too many people come into the house of God and they go home no more empowered than when they came. Because in that service, there was no power. There was nowhere in that service where they could plug in to the power source. Oh, hallelujah. I told you I've been, I went to a UPC many years ago and uh, it was in Mississippi of all places. I was there visiting a friend and she took me to this church. Uh, she had never been there either, so we were just visiting. The worship service was about as dead and dry as any worship service I've ever been in in my life. This poor old man got up and led the worship service and dear Lord have mercy, it was enough to kill you. It was dead, it was dry. Well, there was no spirit in it. It was just awful. And I sat there and I thought, oh, Lord, please don't tell me I came to church so I can go home and feel worse than when I came. Please tell me, Lord. Then the pastor got up and the pastor preached a beautiful, powerful, wonderful message from the Word of God. And I was so lifted up and I was so elevated by that word and I told my friend I said see this is what people don't get when you come to the house of God it's not about the music it's not about whether or not you got choirs it's not about whether or not you got an organist or a pianist it's not about whether or not you got drums or a band no when you come to the house of God the most important element is the message that is being preached Amen. from the pulpit why because that's where the power is that's right. That's right. now if your music and your message are in the same vein then the power is going to flow in the music as well mm -hmm. well I'm going to tell you Riverside Church of God my Lord have mercy I saw the Holy Ghost fall in that church I saw the Spirit of the Lord fall in that church like the day of Pentecost over and over and over and over many 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 times and every single time the preacher was preaching Jesus. He was preaching the cross. 
He was preaching the blood because that's all Brother Gillen knew how to preach. He didn't preach all this other foolishness. You didn't never hear him talking politics. You didn't never hear him talking culture wars. You didn't never hear him preaching against these people or preaching against those people. And back when I first started going there, PTL was going through its troubles, you know, and Jim and Tammy lost their ministry and all that. And Brother Gillum was old-fashioned holiness. He didn't believe in lady, Christian ladies wearing makeup and jewelry and cutting their hair and dressing less than modestly and all that. But you know what? Never one time did Brother Gillum say a word against Jim and Tammy. Not one time. Matter of fact, I heard him say one time, we were talking, he and I were talking one-on-one, -on -one, and I mentioned something about what was going on. And he said, well, he said, bless their hearts. He said, they're, they're sincere people. He said, they really love the Lord, and they're sincere people. See, instead of criticizing and condemning, he looked for something good. And they were sincere people. I don't care what anybody says. I, I, I came to know Tammy a little bit before she died personally at a personal level. And I'm going to tell you something. That was one of the sweetest, kindest, most generous, giving, loving, compassionate human beings that, you'll ever, that you would ever come into contact with. That lady was a wonder. She, she lived this Christian life like few people know how to live it. I'm going to tell you right now. When a porn star can go through a reality TV show and live in a house with you, and he can come away from that experience and say, that woman is a lady. That's what Ron, what's his name, the porn star said, after doing that reality TV show, and Tammy Faye was one of the people in the house, you know, and he come away from that experience and he said, that woman is a lady. He said, if I can say anything about Tammy Faye, she is a lady all the way from start to finish. She is a lady. You don't catch her talking dirty. You don't catch her telling dirty off-color jokes. You don't catch her acting uh, out of place. He said, no, that lady lives every minute of her life as a lady, as a decent human being who knows how to carry herself. She had a testimony. People go to the house of God and they're looking for the power. They look all over the building. Where's the outlet? Where can I plug in at? I don't see it in the music. I don't see it in the choir. The preacher gets up and all he preaches is trap. All he preaches is mania. All he preaches is Christian nationalism. Ain't no power. No, to us who are saved, it is the preaching of the cross that is the power of God. My God, have mercy in Matthew 10, 1, as well as verses 7 and 8. Jesus said, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Down verses uh, 7 and 8. Six, seven, and eight, I believe, he said, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. What did he give them? Power against unclean spirits. To cast them out. And to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And as she go preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Where's the power? When's the last time you saw any of this in the church service? Before I preached today, while I was exhorting at the beginning of the service, I talked about a service not too long ago where I had to cast devils out of a woman, didn't I? Mm -hmm. You know why? Because this preacher preaches Jesus. And you can have all the judgment you want concerning this old gay boy preacher. Honey, they ain't a devil that can stand. 
when I come against it in Jesus' name. Because it ain't about me, it's about him. Hallelujah. Right. And that devil knows where my faith is. Yes. Do I have confidence in who I am? No. Do I have confidence in who he is? Yeah. And devils flee when you know who Jesus is. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, the word of the Lord said, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. In Mark chapter 16, verses 14 through 18, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall, not may, not might, not should, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. First thing on the list, they're going to cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Yeah, we Pentecostal folks got this thing right, honey. Because the believer is going to receive the Holy Ghost. And they will speak with new tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. These signs shall follow them that believe. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Mister, when's the last time you went to church and saw them lay hands on the sick, and they recovered? When's the last time you went to church and saw a demoniac delivered from their oppression? And their bondage. Yeah, but see, I'm going to tell you folks, there are Pentecostal churches in America today haven't seen a miracle in decades. I wouldn't pastor a church where I didn't see miracles. I, I can't pastor a church where I don't see miracles. I've never pastored one in my life where we didn't see miracles and healings and deliverance from demons. I've never pastored a church like that in my life. Why? Because I believe this message. And because I preach the power of God. Yes, yes. And the power of God is not in culture wars. That's right. The power of God is not in political issues. That's right, right. The power of God is not in modern social movements right. and political movements and political parties and political cult leaders. The power of God does not rest there. People come in looking for the power of God and they can't find it. In Acts 14, 1 through 3, it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, Believed, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Verse 3, Acts 14. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, now listen, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace. And granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You preach the right message, you're going to get the right result. <laughs> yes. God don't confirm lies. God does not send miracles to put his stamp of approval on a message that is not accurate and right. Oh my Lord have mercy. If you ain't preaching right, don't expect you're going to see miracles. 
If you ain't preaching right, don't expect you're going to see healings and deliverances. Don't happen that way. No, you got to preach right so you can loose the power of God in the midst of his people. And the power is in the message. My Lord, have mercy. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. So Paul saying, if we're going to get exactly what we deserve in the end, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Listen. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Oh, where's the power? Well, honey, they know power in that church because their message is wrong. And I'm going to tell you, if you shop for a church like you shop for shoes, then God have mercy on your soul. You're in a lot of trouble. I've got family members who shop for churches that way. I'm looking for a program for my kids. I'm looking if they have this for my kids or if they have a gymnasium or if they have this kind of program. Or I don't like that church because they're not big enough. They don't have a choir. They don't have music. They don't have this. They don't have that. Oh, honey, I'm going to tell you something. You ought to be shopping for a church based on the message and the message alone. Yes. When I started my first church 40 years ago, my state overseer and my district overseer came to spend the day with me and I took them around the community and I showed them about four or five different buildings that I was looking at to try to start a church in. Every one of them was more decrepit than the other. Every one of them was falling apart. Every one of them was in a terrible location and in terrible condition. And my old brother here said, Chuck, honey, have you lost your mind? He said, every one of these properties is going to take all kinds of time and effort to fix up in order to have church in it. And I said to Brother uh, Chandler, I said, Brother Chandler, the power of God will bring the people in. My God. I said, if I preach the truth, if I preach this message, if I preach the cross, it will bring the people in. I said, the building don't matter. My state overseer, Brother G.J. Chandler out of Gadsden, Alabama. Brother Chandler looked at me, literally, I'll never forget it, and he said to me, Son, if ever somebody been called to preach, you've been called to preach. That's what he told me. He said, you know how I know? He said, because every young preacher I know thinks that in order to build a church, you've got to have this grand edifice. You've got to have all the accoutrement. You've got to have all the fancies. You've got to have the music. You've got to have the choir. You've got to have a big, beautiful building. He said, you're the first preacher I've heard in decades that has actually said to me, none of those things matter. It's about the message. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And you know what? I was right as rain. We started that church in an old, dusty, I mean dusty, uh, rented hall. It was an old Oddfellows building, kind of like the Elks, or, you know, a community service organization. It was an old Oddfellows building. We were on the third floor, and the highway was raised, ran right outside the windows. You could literally look out of your car and look right into us at a church, because the windows were right alongside of the highway, you know. 
And it was dusty because the cars stir up a lot of dust. And I mean that hall, it was like this. It had wood floors, very high ceilings, just like this room, very, a lot of echo. And we had wood folded seats that were part of the property, you know, and just wood, wooden folded chairs. And I'm gonna tell you something from the first day, the power of God moved in that place because this young preacher knew then what he knows now, 40 years later, that the preaching of the cross is where the power is at. Hallelujah. And oh, I'm going to tell you, I want to be where the power is. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can't stand to be in a church where the power of God is not present. I can't stand to be in a church where the presence of God is not present. The presence of God comes when God's people worship Him, listen to me, in spirit and in truth. But the power of God comes when the message is right. A spiritual mind understands, just like our Lord Jesus Christ, that if we endure today, whatever troubles, whatever struggles, whatever hardships we might have to endure, that we will have much to celebrate tomorrow. Hallelujah. That's how a spiritual mind thinks. You understand, I don't have to have everything today. I don't have to, everything doesn't have to be just right today. No, if I can endure the hardship of today, then tomorrow I'm going to have a lot to celebrate. Hallelujah. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice Paul said, the race that is set before us. Not the race we chose to run. You don't have any choice in what God puts in front of you. You just got to run with patience whatever race God puts in front of you. I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm not happy with where I'm at today. But i got to run this race with patience because God put it in front of me. Hallelujah. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Oh, he knew what the end result was going to be, and because he knew the end result, he was able to endure the here and now. He was able to endure the temporal. He was able to endure that which was temporary. Got news for you, children. Where the church is at today, this is just temporary. This is just temporal. This is just the here and now. We just got to endure this because it's going to be a whole lot better down the road. How do I know? I'm going to tell you how I know. Because we're preaching the cross, and that's where the power is. But carnal minds today, they don't want to lay up treasure in heaven. They want to exercise power and authority on the earth today. So their message is no longer the heavenly anthem of a crucified Christ, but the carnal man-pleasing message of a new world order brought about by the church. A news for you, that message carries with it no power. It is a false message and a message not found in the teachings of God's Word. The Word of God promises one day Jesus will come and He will set everything in order. So the church trying to fix the world is a fool's error. We're not to fix the world. We're to throw a lifeline out to those who are drowning and help them get on the ship of Zion. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God that has the name Yeshua printed on its bow. Jesus, glory to God. That's our job. 
Many in the church world today are consumed by a spirit of religion. And those same people will tell you that the power of God is missing from our pulpits. It's missing from our pews. Our altars today are devoid of the power of God. Listen, because we don't pray enough. We don't fast enough. Isn't it funny how they shift blame away from those who carry the responsibility? Pastor, I'm going to tell you a little secret, honey. The responsibility for the power and presence of God in your church does not lie in your people. It lies in you and you alone because it has to do with the message. Because unto us that are saved, the preaching of the cross is the power of God. If you'll preach the right message, the power will be there. Oh my Lord. If you'll sing the right songs, the presence will be there. Uh -huh. My God, have mercy. They'll tell us that we don't sacrifice enough of our time. We don't put enough of our talents or our skills into the church. But in truth, the answer is found in our primary text. It is not the trappings of religion that bring down upon the people of God the glorious power of God, but it is the preaching of the truth of God, the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the borrowed tomb, the preaching of the empty sepulcher, the preaching of the angelic declaration. He is not here, woohoo, but he is risen. The preaching of the appearance of a risen Lord to more than 500 witnesses at one given time. The preaching of the ascended Christ. The preaching of our returning Lord. Oh, the power today is still in the blood. The blood, as the old song says, will never lose its power. It can still be found. The power of God can still be found in the preaching of the cross. Oh, children, I'm going to tell you today, that's why in this church, I don't know about other church, I don't care about other churches. I have no power, I have no authority, I have no business trying to fix other churches. This is the one I'm worried about. But in this church, we still sing, Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. We still sing at the cross. We still sing, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me, he died at Calvary. Oh, mercy, there was great, and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. My Roman Catholic Portuguese grandmother, told me, she said, when I began to go to a non-Catholic church and I heard the born again message preached, she said it was in that song at Calvary 
that God finally spoke to me and revealed something to me. She said, when they would sing that song, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, no, we not it was for me. He died at Calvary. She said, see, Jane, when I heard those words, knowing not it was for me, he died. She said, I grew up Roman Catholic. I knew Jesus died. I knew he died cool for the world. She said, but all of a sudden that song made real to me that what he did, he did for me. She said, it was that song that caused me to make the decision to be born again. Oh, I want to tell you. Oh, I want to tell you. My great grandmother, bless her heart, I, I, she was a saint like no other that I've ever known in my life. But my great grandmother, before she was saved, I, I'm, I'm told she smoked. And I can't even picture her smoking. She cussed. I can't even imagine her cussing. But that's what they told me. She was a little on the rough side, you know, before she came to the Lord. My little great grandmother said there was a lady evangelist came to our church. And she started singing this song. Come ye sinners, lost and hopeless. Jesus' blood can make you free. For he saved the worst among you. When he saved a wretch like me. And I know, oh yes I know. Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. And I know, oh yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner clean. And my great grandmother said, it was that song that turned me to Jesus, that caused me to know that I could be born again because no matter how vile I was, oh, Jesus' blood could make the vilest sinner clean. And I want to tell you something. I kid you not. You never saw a Christian like my great grandmother. You never saw. I've, I've known very few people in my life could touch her with a 10-foot pole. That lady lived this thing like nobody's business. But see, back then they sang songs that celebrated the cross. That celebrated the blood. That celebrated the empty tomb. That celebrated the risen Lord. And it was the message of the song that oftentimes helped to turn the heart of the listener to the gospel. Oh, may the cross be ever at the center of our song. May the blood be always at the forefront of our preaching. Amen. May we never become so embroiled in the tumult and travesty that is this world that we spend more time preaching about the disease that is sin rather than the cure which is the Christ of Calvary. When saints and sinners alike come into the house of God and ask the question, where then is the power? Answer them simply in this way. There's power in the blood. There's power in the preaching of the cross. Oh, children, if the message is right, the power will be present. Where the power is absent, the message is inaccurate. Lastly, Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them 
and confirming the word with signs following. People do not come into the church looking for political power or influence over our society. They come in looking for the power of God that conquers sin and guarantees them heaven. Believers come in looking for faith that saves the lost, heals the sick, cleanses the lepers, and raises the dead. They come in looking for the power that delivers from demons and sets the captive free. And that power, my friend, is not found in the preaching again of the GOP or Mega or Trump. It is found in the preaching of the cross. In closing, Philippians 3, 17 through 21. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have for us an example. So in other words, he said, look at people who live like we do. Look at people who follow what we've taught and what we've preached. And use them as an example. He said, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, listen, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Listen, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto him. Self. Oh, children, where then is the power? The power is in the cross. I want us to close this afternoon. I want us to sing this marvelous old song. We have sing it often in the cross. Hallelujah.
Beyond the 